feel someone touching me almost on a nightly basis in my bedroom. This time on Unexplained Mysteries, Extreme Psychics. He says he tries to touch you to get your attention. Immediately I felt that I was high. He stood exactly where the killer was. Bam, I'm in there. ESP, Second Sight, The Sixth Sense. It is the ability to see what others cannot. With our exclusive case studies, we'll hear the remarkable stories of ordinary people touched by a psychic encounter. She used the term, I'm in the water, and uh, I'm falling, I hit my head. I believe the Nancy Myers will come up with something. I truly believe in my heart. If I knew then what I know now, Yes, I would have got there and followed her earlier. The expert who may have discovered the secret of second sight. It may be just something about the trauma that allows the, the psychic information to get to the surface. A woman arrested after reporting her telepathic vision. I don't think I was thinking right, but I knew I had to go see for myself. The waitress haunted by a dead customer. The bed was vibrating, and all of a sudden, I saw a shadow walk across the front of the TV. The Arizona Hotel with some unwanted guests. There are things that have happened in this building that I can't explain. The main feeling that I get is energy being pulled out of me. We'll explore all the paranormal possibilities. We have no idea what the physiology of the psychic experience is. I believe in what I can feel and touch and smell and hear. Life is a mystery. Sometimes things happen that you can't explain. Then take you inside the psychic experience. My whole body would just start uh, sobbing like a little child sobs after they've been crying for a long time. And we'll give you the final analysis in our Unex Report as we uncover the truth about ESP on Unexplained Mysteries, Extreme Psychics. Where did the powers of the psychic come from? Why do some people have this extraordinary gift? Some are born with it. For others, it all begins with an accident. I was in a car and my, uh, I, it's like I passed out. My, my foot went down on the accelerator. I had all kinds of trauma to my head. This side of my face was all black. I had glass in this eye. The whole side of my head was just a mess. Joyce Martin's accident nearly killed her. It also left her with an extraordinary ability. Dr. Richard Broughton has studied the phenomenon. It may be just something about the trauma, whether it's electrical trauma or accident trauma or whatever, um, that shakes up the brain or changes something that we don't understand yet, but allows the, the psychic information to get to the surface. It's almost like I can tune in to the victim and I can see through their eyes. It's almost like I become the victim because I can feel the pain. A few months after her accident, Joyce was driving home from work when she heard a newscast about a kidnapping. A little girl named Vicki Lynn Hoskinson disappeared while running an errand on her bicycle. I heard on the car radio that she was missing, and I drove to the area that Vicki Lynn had uh, been abducted. And when I got over there, I knew that she had gone over the top of her bicycle, that, that the car had hit the, the back of the bicycle, and that her hands were in dirt. Joyce's vision was so real, she was compelled to call the police. At first, they were skeptical. I don't necessarily believe in psychics, but the information that, she, that I received from her on the telephone uh, was so accurate that I became very interested in, in talking to her in person. They finally agreed to meet Joyce and check up on her premonition. We went out to Ina Road, and as we got just past Wade, there's a big dip, and in the middle of the dip is where my, my whole body would just start uh, sobbing like a little child sobs after they've been crying for a long time. She made me stop and she looked over to the right and she says, this really looks like it. This is what I see. We got out of the car and we looked around and she says, I cannot understand why she's not here. Could her vision have been wrong? Joyce didn't think so. Too many things were here. The windmill, the old wagon, the barn, everything she had seen, except 
the little girl. Sadly, seven months later, Vicki Lynn's body was found, less than 100 feet from the spot Joyce had predicted. Vicki Lynn's father is now a believer. He wishes that police would have taken Joyce's vision more seriously. If I knew then what I know now, yes, I would have got her involved earlier. I would have listened to her more. I don't know how this works. I don't know how to stop it. I don't know how to start it. I've never really thought that uh, it was because I had a bump on the head. Greta Alexander can also trace her extrasensory powers to an accident. As a girl, she was struck by lightning. And after that thing has begun happening, I would sense and I would know and I would feel. And from that moment on, I began dreaming, seeing pictures, which I know now as clairvoyance, and hearing, which is clara audio, and just feeling inside, which is clara sensory. And that's how it all started. These psychic visions would eventually lead Greta to this swollen river in Kelowna, Illinois. A flash flood had swept through the city. Fire Chief John Swan was at the scene alongside Ty Massey. The last thing I can remember is, you know, his patch on the side of his shirt hanging on, trying to get him above water, which I couldn't. Uh, we both went under. Um, I couldn't hang on any longer, and I had to uh, let him go. Ty was a respected member of the police department. He had a wife and a child on the way. He had everything to live for, but the rescue call to the river would be his last. He fell into the water and vanished. He was in the air when I seen him. And um, he hit the ground in, um, right at the water line and uh, started uh, floating out into the river. He became unconscious. And uh, that's what caused Ty to not be able to save himself. The next morning, they started dragging the river for his body. It seemed hopeless until Ty's spirit seemed to reach out to Greta. Immediately I felt that I was Ty and immediately I had to call to tell them. As we talked, um, uh, we went on and uh, she used the terms I'm in the water and uh, I'm falling, uh, I hit my head. I think John was a little mind boggled by the whole thing and you could tell in his voice. I had more important things I thought at that time. We had uh, 200 rescuers, we had dive teams, dogs team, we had helicopters in the air. So we had a lot of things um, that was going on that I felt was way more important at that time. As John searched the river for his friend, Ty's family tried to come to terms with the fact that his body may not be found. It was unbelievable to think that you lost a child was unbearable, but to think that your, that your child was in the river and no one can find him, it, it was, it's indescribable. But the messages kept coming to Greta and Greta kept trying to convince John Swan to listen. I was so upset with John. Uh, he just wouldn't do what I told him to do. I didn't let all this known to everyone because I didn't want the, basically the public to get the wrong impression that John Swan uses um, psychics to do all his rescue. I said, that's the case, we might as well eliminate a lot of our equipment and just <laughs> have Greta come sit at our fire station. I just felt like I got to go up there and do this because he isn't doing it. I picked up the cellular phone and I was talking and it was Greta again. She says, uh, John, she stopped for a second. She says, you're near the water, aren't you? And I was standing right in the, at the river. And I said, yes, I'm next to the river. She stopped for a second. She says, I'm just down from that big yellow green thing or that big yellow thing or green structure. There's something big and yellow by you. I go, hmm, I got her this time. I said, okay, we're going to go back out. And uh, thanks, Greta, I hung up the phone. And I said, she's messed up this time. I turned around, and there was a big yellow-green fire truck right behind me. And I go, oh, wow. You know, so I'm, uh, at that time, um, I'm getting very nervous. And because there's too many things she's saying that made sense. Now that she had his attention, Greta told Chief Swan, exactly where to find Ty Massey's body. I told one of my new firefighters, get a pike pole, which is a pole with a hook on it, about 12, 15 foot long, go down to the third brush pile above the railroad bridge, and get inside the brush pile, and you have to go deep, about eight foot down, and hook Ty Massey and pull him out. They went up to the north command post, got a pike pole, went down to that brush pile, reached in, and 
pull Ty out. Can an injury to the brain really bring out psychic powers? Experts believe the phenomenon needs further study. We have no idea what the physiology of the psychic experience is. I don't think we can ignore the fact that, that trauma seems to be associated with certain psychic abilities, but it's not the whole answer. I always thank my angels because they bring it to me. And I always bless them and the family because I think if that were me, I would want them to leave no stone unturned in order to close that door. If the accident had not occurred, no way would I be doing this. I, I don't know what I would be doing, but I know I would not be sitting here today. Coming up on Unexplained Mysteries, more psychic visions revealed. I feel someone touching me almost on a nightly basis in my bedroom. He says he tries to touch you to get your attention. A telepathic vision leads an ordinary housewife to a missing body. At the end of the object were white nurse's shoes. She was brought down by the police department and arrested for the murder of this woman. What is the average person to do when they start having intuitive impressions about, say, a crime? We'll talk to an ordinary woman whose life was changed by a gruesome vision. I knew the police would never tell me. And I was afraid maybe they wouldn't look. A psychic tour through a former hospital. I picked up somebody hanging themselves very clearly in this uh, environment. Detectives on the trail of an unknown killer. This has been a very frustrating case. I believe in what I can feel and touch and smell and hear. This is someone capable of becoming a serial killer. And we'll unlock all the secrets with our Unex report. Stay tuned for more on Unexplained Mysteries. Unexplained Mysteries, Extreme Psychics. Extrasensory perception isn't limited to psychics. Sometimes, an ordinary person experiences a paranormal vision that defies all logic. Edda Smith had never had a psychic experience in her life. A newscast changed all that. It was 3 o'clock in the afternoon and I was listening to a radio broadcast while at work. And they said that they had found the lady's vehicle in Pacoima, uh, I think on a dead end street, and that they were making a house to house search for her. And as soon as they said house to house search and, and that thought registered, it was as if someone said to me, she's not in a house. I saw a picture. It was as if someone had put a picture right in front of me. She immediately reported her vision to the police, giving them a detailed account of what she believed had happened. I explained uh, exactly. It'd be the right-hand side with a dirt path to her, a hill behind her. He suggested that I show him on a wall map where this area was, and that's when we discovered that it was Lopez Canyon. I don't think I was thinking right, but I knew I had to go see for myself. I, I knew the police would never tell me. And I was afraid maybe they wouldn't look. Driving to the spot in her vision, Etta made a shocking discovery. As my eyes traveled further across the object, at the end of the object were white nurse's shoes. But once the authorities determined that Etta's vision was accurate, she became their number one suspect. She went home and then subsequently she was brought down by the police department and arrested for the murder of this woman. Her children were kept for 10 to 15 hours. She was kept for four days. She was interviewed at 14 to 18 hours at a time, uh, taken lie detector test. Uh, it was a grueling four days in a very difficult situation. Etta was eventually cleared of the crime, but no one was able to fully explain her single psychic vision. It's possible for living, breathing human beings to come up with um, some very strong information about um, distant situations that they could not know about. Jorianne Defray has been called to the Jerome Grand Hotel in Arizona to unlock the mystery of a haunting that has gone on for years. As I stop here, this is dense to me. This is heavy, this is thick. 
I've got goosebumps going up and down my whole body. Jorianne's sixth sense began as a little girl when she received an injury to her head. Since then, she claims she has been able to predict the future, see into the past, and speak with ghosts. Has anyone ever felt like somebody, like psychically, coughing on them, or? It was my mother-in-law was staying in the room next door here, and she swears up and down that somebody was walking up and down the hallway up in this area, coughing. They had had a number of plagues hit the valley. Here with a lot of your underground mining and stuff, there, uh, some people were more susceptible to, to lung problems. Impressions that Jorianne has picked up on date back to when this scenic hotel was a hospital. It was built in the 1920s for the residents of Jerome, who came to work in the prosperous copper mines. But when the mines closed, Jerome became a ghost town. It's gone through many, many years of being vacant and somehow remained intact. I don't know what basically protected it. Larry Altier and his brother Bob bought the property and refurbished it as a hotel. But shortly after the grand opening, strange things started to happen. We had one person on the third floor. Nobody came in the building, and he says that there was somebody knocking on his door and attempted to open it. And now I can rely on myself, because I am the one here. There was no other way to get up there. That's why Jory Ann is here, to make contact with whatever haunts this former hospital. But what she senses is an event that happened after the hospital closed. I picked up a shooting and a hanging. You did? Yes, I did. I'm telling you, you're scary. The shooting that you're referring to was an attempt. It wasn't successful. And that happened in the room we just walked through. The uh, superintendent was successful in his shooting. Now, here's one I don't know about. As she continues deeper into the hotel, Jory Ann uncovers a dark secret. Was there anyone that was involved in a relationship situation at all that kind of drove them, yes. you know, beyond the point and stuff? Because I'm telling you, something heavy was going on. It was a rom right romantic on situation. The gentleman that lived here was, was uh, separated from his wife. Okay. Uh, by some circumstances that he had no control over at all. He ended up living here while she was living in Clarkdale. And I guess at some point, it just got to be too much for him. When Ron Ballator was the sheriff in Jerome, he discovered a body in this room. I, you know, I picked up somebody hanging themselves very clearly in this uh, environment. Jorianne found another hot spot of psychic activity centered around the elevator. When I was coming into the elevator, I sensed that there was like a, a heaviness in the air. It felt like it was uh, thicker, more dense. She follows this feeling down to the utility room. This seems to be significant. It felt like activity around this area. Did the elevators ever get stuck or anything like that also? In 1935, they were having a problem with it. See, and even right now, sitting here, I'm getting a little pain in my head. I don't know if um, a, a person got, you know, got caught up back here or got stuck or having problems back here. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, did they expire? Yes. They did expire. Records prove that in 1935, a maintenance engineer was found here with his head crushed. His death was ruled an accident, but there are those who believe that there is more to this death than was originally reported. There were a lot of questions that weren't asked. Um, I think they were in a hurry to get as much of the minimum facts in as they could so that they could come to that verdict that it was an accidental death and that the company had no uh, responsibility in it. Jorian also senses that the death was not accidental. She feels that until this mystery is solved, the spirit will continue to haunt this building. And I believe that he is unsettled. I believe that there is some restlessness around him and his questionable death. Coming up, a psychic looks through the eyes of a killer. There's no expression, the eyes are wooden. Nothing will stop it. A mother puts her faith in the paranormal. I believe the nursing eyes will uh, come up with something. A detective searching for the truth. Quite frankly, I didn't know what to expect. A woman scared for her best friend's life. I wanted to leave, but I didn't want to leave Shirley alone with this thing. The intentions of the spirit may not be to hurt me, but it has hurt me. And 
finally, we'll tie it all up in the Unex Report on Unexplained Mysteries, Extreme Psychics. Unexplained Mysteries, Extreme Psychics. The police are probably the last people anyone would expect to call a psychic. But there are a handful of psychics that detectives turn to when all else has failed. There's energy in every murder scene. When I look at stacks of photos of a murder scene, I am not trying to look at this poor, battered body. What I'm looking for is somewhere when that photographer moved all the way around the body, he stood exactly where the killer was at a moment when the killer was open. Bam, I'm in there. Nancy Meyer has come to Nags Head, North Carolina to solve a murder. Homicide detectives Cliff Midget and Tom Gilliam need help. They have a body, but very few leads. Almost every clue in the case was washed away by a hurricane. This has been a very frustrating case. Potential suspects that we had early on in this case have been eliminated. I believe in what I can feel and touch and smell and hear, but at this point in the investigation, I'm not gonna rule out anything that might provide a lead. I believe that Nancy Myers will uh, come up with something. I truly believe in my heart. It all started at the Port of Call restaurant. Janet Siklari is celebrating the last day of summer vacation with some friends. That evening after dinner, uh, Janet and two of her friends went to the port call restaurant and stayed there for several hours. Her two girlfriends left an hour or so earlier. Janet stayed until closing. Janet drove to the Hotel Carolinian, where she was sharing a room with her brother. After checking in with him, she went down to the beach to smoke a cigarette. Once she left the room, we really don't know what happened. Between that time and shortly after six o'clock in the morning, she was brutally murdered on the beach, just a short distance east of the motel. I ran out the door uh, onto the deck. There were police everywhere, you know, restraining me, not letting me up to the beach. And I said, my sister hadn't, hasn't come home. You know, she hasn't come home and they, they wouldn't let me up on the beach. And uh, in my heart, I knew that, that poor Janet had, you know, was gone. The brutal crime shocked this sleepy coastal village. A massive manhunt began, but within hours, it was called off. Hurricane Emily was on her way towards Nags Head. We completed the crime scene investigation and started interviewing potential witnesses. But on Sunday morning, we were put on Hurricane standby and watch and started evacuating the area. Any potential suspect was gone. Any evidence of the crime wiped out by the hurricane. One year passed and police were no closer to finding Janet's killer. It's been a very frustrating case. The fact that nobody that we've contacted or we've spoken to has seen anything, nobody's heard anything. With no leads, no suspects, and no clues, detectives make the controversial decision to call psychic Nancy Meyer. He has a long-standing hatred of women. A veil comes over his face, there's no expression, the eyes are wooden, nothing will stop him. I would say you are dealing with a very disturbed man. I would suspect this is someone capable of becoming a serial killer if he is not already. Each photograph brings Nancy closer to the killer. Photo after photo after photo. There was a personal connection. She has known him for a while. You said that this was a planned event on his part? Yes. He seems to have been watching her earlier in the evening, but at a good enough distance so that no one, because some of the people she was with might have recognized him. So he's watching at a distance. So he had parked his car in the parking lot there at the hotel. He seems to have walked a little bit to get to where she died. Nancy is able to describe the killer to a police sketch artist. He has like light brown hair, grayish eyes. They look kind of like a cross between gray, blue, and hazel. Although not all of Nancy's visions were correct, 
she has inspired the police to keep looking. Mrs. Meyer's involvement in this case today is the first opportunity that I've had to work one-on-one -on -one with the psychic. And quite frankly, I didn't know what to expect. She was able to tell us a great deal more information than I had ever hoped for. The case was solved in May of 2001, leading to a conviction for the rape and murder of Janet Siclari. Coming up on Unexplained Mysteries, a famous psychic helps a waitress get rid of an unwanted customer. He used to always say, I'll come back, and I said, don't even. He says he tries to touch you to get your attention. I wanted to leave, but I didn't want to leave Shirley alone with this thing. And a Florida psychic locates a missing man from 300 miles away. I see him in the air going downward. I was pretty much convinced that that was the spot. He said, look, I know he's in it. I know we've got the right spot. You get the ultimate truth about psychic powers with our Unex report on Unexplained Mysteries. Explained Mysteries, Extreme Psychics. Sylvia Brown's regular guest appearances on the Montel Williams Show have made her into one of the most famous psychics in the country. Among her talents is the ability to communicate with the spirit world. Whenever I go out on a um a haunting. Usually what happens if it is truly a haunting is about at the approach of where I'm going to be. A sense of heaviness like now begins to come over me. It begins to be really heavy in the chest. Today, she is here to help Shirley get rid of an unwanted visitor. I feel someone touching me almost on a nightly basis in my bedroom more or less personal things. My cover's moving, uh, someone's sitting on the end of my bed. The intentions of the spirit may not be to hurt me. It may just want my attention, but it has hurt me. And I've even told it, you're hurting me and leave me alone and don't bother me. Shirley's nightmare began two years earlier when she struck up a friendship with a customer at the restaurant where she was working. He lived on a yacht in the harbor and he came in three times a day to eat. And when he became ill, he called the restaurant and asked that I call him. But it really was more like a friendship on his part more than it was on mine, because it seemed like that I was constantly helping John. A few months later, John passed away. Since he had no family, Shirley was called on to take care of his belongings. She gave away most everything except for some furniture that she took home. When I moved the furniture in, that's when the problem started, that month. That's why I think it's John. And John wasn't the only spirit haunting Shirley. Another friend of hers had recently died after leaving her with an unsettling message. I was very close to Zach. He was my best friend at that time. He used to always say, I'll come back. And I said, don't even, and he'd laugh and everything. Being alone with two ghosts was more than Shirley could handle. My best friend Jan lives at the end of the street, and I called her one night and told her that I was terrified and I couldn't go to sleep, so she brought her daughter and she came down. We were all sitting on Shirley's bed, and my daughter could feel it. The bed was vibrating. And I was watching the TV, and all of a sudden, I saw a shadow walk across the front of the TV. You could feel it shaking, and sometimes you could see its imprint sitting on the bed sheets on her leg. I wanted to leave. I mean, I was scared, but I didn't want to leave Shirley alone either, you know, with this thing. I worry a lot about her, tried to find ways to get help for her, and we haven't been able to. It was then that Shirley decided to contact Sylvia Brown. Oh, hi, I'm Sylvia Brown. So good to see you. I hear Thank you've been you having some problems here. A lot of problems. As she is being led upstairs to the bedroom, Sylvia seems to make contact with one of the spirits. Oh, somebody was very sick. Thin oval face, gaunt eyes, male. There is a pathway 
this entity walks from this area here, about here, um, limping somehow, and then couldn't walk, coming over this way. The spirit then seems to speak to Sylvia. He has a voice, he says. He says he tries to touch you to get your attention. Yes, he does. Um, in ways that are inappropriate. Yes, he does. Um, breasts and mm -hmm. below waist and, mm -hmm. and also something in your ear. Mm -hmm. Exactly. He says he waited around because he wanted to be able to talk and explain to you through me that he's sorry. He wants you to get rid of his whatever it is. I did. He says the property was tainted. Well, he didn't live long after he got the property that I had. Now, who was the more slender one? John. OK, and the other big one is that. The one that's caused you the most problems, though, is the, the bigger one. What well, does he say what he wants? Well, he said he, he made a pact with himself that if there was any way he could get back and prove that there was light after this, he was going to make damn sure it was to you. And I think John's here almost to protect you from Zach. Isn't that funny? Not that Zach would hurt you, but I think John came in as sort of a protectorate because Zach was getting out of hand. Is he going on, Sylvia? He's going to go on, I promise you that. Sylvia attempts to send the spirits of John and Zach to the other side. By the grace of God and the Holy Spirit, you've got to go. You've got to go to the other side and be about your business. Within a few months, the spirits were back, both drawn to Shirley, just as they had been in life. If I have to live with it, I hope that I'll be able to understand it a little bit better. And that maybe, like I said, I can just get on with my life for a change because I certainly haven't been able to for the last year and a half. Next on Unexplained Mysteries, a missing persons case baffles the police. It became pretty apparent that uh, this wasn't your, your average missing persons case. A brother desperate for answers. This was something new that we could try. We just were willing to try anything. A detective takes a risky gamble. Should be very simple. There's railroad tracks, there's bricks, there's a bridge. And the long distance psychic's unusual insight. I don't need to see you. I don't need to see the scene of the crime. And finally, we'll analyze the evidence of these clairvoyant encounters in our UNX report on Unexplained Mysteries. Unexplained Mysteries Extreme Psychics. One of the more grim talents attributed to psychics is the ability to locate missing bodies. Williston, Florida. Destination for seniors looking to escape the cold northern winters. This is where Norman Lewis came when he retired. Then one morning, Norman packed up his fishing poles and headed off in his pickup truck and never came back. Joe Lewis was used to his brother taking off on extended fishing trips, but this was different. We couldn't find anything missing. Everything uh, seemed to be there. His, his billfold, his, uh, all of his identification and, and medication, and he had asbestosis and, uh, and glaucoma. Of course, as the days turned into weeks and the weeks turned into months, it became pretty apparent that uh, this wasn't your, your average missing persons case. Eight months passed, and the case was eventually handed off to investigator Brian Hewitt. Hewitt combed through the old files looking for a clue. He re-interviewed every witness, every family member. No lead was too small to follow up on. People would call in thinking that they possibly had seen him or the truck, uh, and then I'd track that down and uh, Another dead end. With nothing to lose, Hewitt contacted a psychic he had met a year earlier at a police seminar. This was something new that we could try. We just were willing to try anything. Hewitt made the two-hour drive to Orlando. There, he met with psychic Noreen Rainier. I only work with the police. 
Uh, I don't need to see you. I don't need to see the scene of the crime. Let me touch something off the body. I prefer metal. I prefer a watch, a ring, an earring, a belt buckle. Noreen believes objects retain the psychic residue of the owner. This is known as psychometry. Each touch reveals a clue. Each clue brings her closer to Norman. I see brick. Don't know what it's associated with, but I just feel the brick very strong. It appears to be a bridge. I feel metal around me. I feel plants. She talked about railroad tracks. I'm driving for a short distance, and then something happens, and I see him in the air going downward. Should be very simple. There's railroad tracks, the bricks, there's a bridge. I, I'm, I'm seeing from above, and it looks like there's branches or trees or something below there. Although she had never been to Williston, Noreen had described one of the town's most distinctive features and one of Norman's favorite fishing spots, the quarry. Once I determined that 80% of the elements that she mentioned were in that location, I was pretty much convinced that that was the spot. With the location narrowed down, Hewitt called in a police diving team to search the water. The dive team made their search and came up empty-handed. A lot of people, and maybe even myself included, would have said, uh, all right, we tried, but Brian wasn't that way. He said, look, I know he's in there. I know we've got the right spot, but we're just not using the right techniques. So that's when we turned to the Navy. Although I don't think we'd ever gotten them here had they known that they were acting on a psyche's tip. The diving team wasn't told why they were searching this spot. All they knew was that Norman was a Navy man. That was something these men could understand. I met them uh, the first day they were in there. Then they said, if he's, if he's a truck in here, we'll find him. Determined to end the Lewis's grief, the divers combed the lake. Within hours, they locate Norman's truck. When we found the vehicle, Joe was there. Joe was up on a cliff. And that's when Brian came up and told us that they'd, they'd found the truck. And I, I asked him, I said, is he in it? And he said, yeah. It was a sad day because, you know, obviously Norman was, was deceased. But on the upside, it was, you know, finally over to get a you know, good, decent burial and the family could go on with their lives. Next, the Unax Report. We'll examine the evidence and answer the questions. Where do psychics get their power? Can a bump on the head bring out telepathic abilities? Or is this a gift given at birth? And if you discover you have the power, how would you use it? We'll bring it all together next with our Unex Report. When Unexplained Mysteries returns. And now for the Unex Report. They have the ability to see what others cannot. Some can communicate with the dead. Others appear to pick up psychic impressions of traumatic events. But no one understands where these powers come from. Some believe that it can originate with an injury to the brain. If the accident had not occurred, no way would I be doing this. A few discover the power within themselves. Photo after photo after photo, there was a personal connection. She has known him for a while. He wanted to be able to talk and explain to you through me that he's sorry. Some even speculate that everyone has the ability. They just haven't developed it. Maybe there's more to life than you thought about. Maybe you're capable of more than you thought about. We've heard from an ordinary woman who experienced a single, unexplainable vision. It was as if someone said to me, she's not in a house. I saw a picture. It was as if someone had put a picture right in front of me. And a psychic who helped police track down a killer. I would suspect this is someone capable of becoming a serial killer. He is not already. She was able to tell us a great deal more information than I had ever hoped for. 
As we've seen, each psychic's gift is unique. Let me touch something off the body. I prefer metal. I prefer a watch, a ring, an earring, a belt buckle. When that photographer moved all the way around the body, he stood exactly where the killer was at a moment when the killer was open. Bam, I'm in there. But not everyone is convinced that the power is real. I believe in what I can feel and touch and smell and hear. Life is a mystery. Sometimes things happen that you can't explain. Even those who are blessed with second sight aren't sure why. I don't know how this works. I don't know how to stop it. I don't know how to start it. I always thank my angels because they bring it to me. In the end, the most compelling evidence comes from the people whose lives have been touched by a psychic encounter. He used to always say, I'll come back. And I said, don't even. She looked over to the right, and she says, this really looks like it. This is what I see. If I knew then what I know now, yes, I would have got her involved earlier. It's been said that the human brain has the capacity to figure out everything except itself which is why the powers of the psychic will always remain an unexplained mystery. A body is more than just a body. It is the connection to a crime scene. It is the missing piece to the puzzle. It is the key to putting a criminal behind bars. Dead Men Talking, tomorrow at 8, followed by the interrogators at 10, only on Bio.